Hello, and welcome to this presentation, Understanding EMI Debugging with Oscilloscopes. In this short presentation, we'll discuss the basic technical concepts and procedures behind EMI debugging using an oscilloscope and near-field probes. Before we talk about EMI debugging with an oscilloscope, it might be a good idea to explain what EMI is. EMI stands for electromagnetic interference, that is, unintended and undesired radio frequency emissions that are generated by a device. Almost everything that runs on electricity produces various unintended or spurious emissions, and EMI testing is important because these emissions can cause problems for other electric or electronic devices. These problems can range from relatively minor and merely annoying effects like pixelation on a screen or audio artifacts, but in some cases unwanted emissions have led to physical damage and even to human injury and death. Therefore, regulations and standards exist with regards to the acceptable levels of emissions at different frequencies. Most electrical and electronic device manufacturers have to test for compliance to these standards, and this testing is often done in anechoic or shielded chambers, using specialized antennas and receivers. When issues are detected, additional grounding and shielding are two of the most common ways of reducing or eliminating unwanted emissions. EMI compliance testing is performed in the so-called far field, where RF propagates through space as more or less plane waves, whose electrical and magnetic components have roughly the same magnitude. Depending on signal frequency, transmitting antenna, etc., the far field begins a wavelength or two from the source. Compliance testing in the far field tells us that a problem exists, in the form of emissions above a given threshold. Debugging, on the other hand, is done in the near field, and is done to help us determine the location of the problem, that is, which component, wire, trace, etc., is responsible for the unwanted emission. This is important because in order to remove unwanted emissions and to make our device compliant, we usually need to know what part of our device is creating these emissions. The EMI debugging process consists therefore of three steps. First, we detect and characterize the emissions. What are the frequencies and levels of the undesired signals? Do any of them display a behavior that could help us identify them? For example, are they integer multiples of a clock signal? We then attempt to locate the physical source of these emissions. Again, which components, wires, traces, etc. contribute to these emissions. And lastly, we employ various remediation techniques like grounding and shielding to remove or at least reduce the level of these emissions. The most common tools used in EMI debugging are oscilloscopes and near-field probes. Let's start by talking about near-field probes. Recall again that EMI debugging is performed in the near-field, so it shouldn't be a surprise that near-field probes are used to acquire these signals. These probes are different from the passive or active probes used in most other types of oscilloscope measurements. Near-field probes can be divided into two main groups, magnetic near-field probes and electric near-field probes. In many cases, radiated emission levels can be quite small, so occasionally a preamplifier is also used between the probe and the scope. Near-field probes have low gain, so you need a sensitive scope if you're not using a preamplifier. Correct probe selection and use is critical in getting good results during EMI debugging, so let's spend some time looking at these different probes and how they should be used. We'll start with magnetic or H-field probes. H-field probes are typically in the shape of a loop. Maximum response occurs when the loop is at 90 degrees to the signal or when the magnetic field is passing through the loop. Minimum response occurs when the loop is parallel to the signal. Typically, the loop is rotated during troubleshooting. With regards to the size of the loop, there's a trade-off between resolution and sensitivity. A large loop is more sensitive, but it has lower spatial resolution, whereas a smaller loop is less sensitive, but makes it easier to narrow down the location of a signal source. Note that in a pinch, you can create a crude H-field probe out of a normal passive probe, simply by connecting the probe ground lead to the probe tip. There's a second non-loop type of magnetic near-field probe that has very high spatial resolution, it can also be used to determine the current on the surface of integrated circuits or through capacitors. The magnetic field is detected at the gap on the probe tip, indicated here by a white line. E-field probes, on the other hand, have their maximum response when they're placed parallel to the measured electric field. For most conductors, the E-field is perpendicular to the surface of the conductor, so we hold E-field probes perpendicular to the conductors that we're testing. Large area probes are used for measuring electric fields emitted from structures with larger surface areas. The top of the probe is electrically shielded, and measurements are made using the bottom side of the probe. 
the smaller near-field E probes are shielded so as to suppress fields from other adjacent structures. These probes have very high spatial selectivity, typically less than a millimeter. This means they can often be used to isolate the location down to a single narrow trace on a crowded printed circuit board. With regards to the use of scopes in EMI debugging, one important point is that oscilloscopes are normally used to view amplitude, that is voltage, in the time domain. However, for EMI debugging, we're concerned with the level of unwanted emissions as a function of frequency. Therefore, we need to make frequency domain measurements similar to those made using spectrum analyzers or EMI receivers. The conversion from the time domain to the frequency domain is done using the Fast Fourier Transform, or FFT. Most modern digital oscilloscopes have FFT support, although performance and functionality may vary significantly between different scopes. FFT mode on oscilloscopes is usually very similar in operation to spectrum analyzers. For example, things like setting the center frequency, span, resolution bandwidth, etc. In addition to the basic FFT operations, additional helpful functions include spectrograms, frequency mass triggers, and peak lists. Let's look briefly at each of these. An FFT display shows the standard frequency domain representation of signals as power versus frequency. A spectrogram as the dimension of time. In other words, we see power versus frequency versus time. In a spectrogram, the y-axis is time and power is mapped into color. In most default spectrogram color schemes, higher power is indicated by moving towards the color red, and lower powers are indicated by moving towards the color purple. Note, however, that the color table or mapping used in spectrograms is very often adjusted to show signals of interest more clearly or simply based on user preference. Spectrograms are valuable because they help us visualize things that might otherwise be hard to see, like time varying signals, low level continuous signals near the noise floor, etc. Some EMI issues involve undesired or spurious signals that are continually present, but many issues involve intermittent signals that are difficult to detect and or analyze. One way of resolving these types of issues is to trigger on a power that exceeds a user-defined threshold at a given frequency or over a given frequency range. This is unlike normal oscilloscope triggering based on voltage changes over time. A so-called frequency mask trigger allows the user to define a power versus frequency mask. When this mask is violated, the trigger stops the scope acquisition and the captured data can then be analyzed in detail. In EMI debugging, higher level or peak signals are often the most interesting or the most important, in part because these signals may violate regulatory thresholds and in part because higher amplitude signals tend to cause more problems than lower amplitude signals. So identifying the peaks in our spectrum is very important. We can find these peaks in several ways, such as manually inspecting the graph, and or using cursors or markers. As you can see, both of these are time consuming and error prone. Most modern oscilloscopes have a peak search or peak list function that will automatically return a list of the highest amplitude signals and their respective frequencies. Let's summarize what we've learned. First, remember that the term EMI or electromagnetic interference refers to problems created by undesired radio frequency emissions being generated by a device under test. Most electrical and electronic devices are tested to ensure that their levels of emissions conform to a standard. This compliance testing is usually done in the far field, that is, using things like chambers, large antennas, and spectrum analyzers, or EMI receivers. The process of resolving any detected EMI issues is called EMI debugging, and is performed in the near field, most commonly using oscilloscopes and near field probes. EMI debugging is a bit of an art, but the proper use of the two types of near-field probes, that is, E-field and H-field, is very important for getting good results quickly. On the scope side, we use the FFT function to turn our time domain instrument into a frequency domain instrument, since EMI debugging involves looking at power versus frequency. And finally, additional FFT-related functions, such as spectrograms, frequency mask triggers, and peak lists, are also very helpful in debugging EMI issues. This concludes our presentation understanding EMI debugging with oscilloscopes. Thanks for watching.